In 2019, Australia broke ground on an ambitious project that could redefine how energy is stored and delivered, not just for the country, but as a model for the world. It's massive in scale, complex in execution, and incredibly expensive. It involves thousands of workers, miles of underground tunnels, and three enormous tunnel boring machines. The project is known as Snowy 2.0, and it's shaping up to be one of the most significant infrastructure undertakings in the Southern Hemisphere. But here's the twist. It was never supposed to be this complicated. To understand the present, we need to look to the past. This new endeavor is actually an expansion of one of Australia's greatest engineering feats. The original Snowy Mountain Scheme, now retroactively dubbed Snowy 1.0. Back in the mid-20th century, Australia faced a major challenge. A rapidly growing population and increasing demand for agricultural water in the southeast. Much of the water from the Australian Alps, particularly from a snowy river, was simply flowing into the sea, untapped and unused. That's when planners decided to rethink the river's purpose. The result was the Snowy Mountain Scheme, a sprawling network of 16 major dams, 9 hydroelectric power stations, 2 pumping stations, and over 140 miles of tunnel and pipelines. Its core function? to redirect billions of gallons of water from the Snowy River into the already stressed Murray and Murrumbidgee Rivers to support farming, while also generating clean, renewable energy in the process. How much water are we talking about? Approximately 555 billion gallons annually, enough to sustain vast swathes of farmland in New South Wales and Victoria, and to underpin agricultural output worth over $3 billion Australian dollars a year. That's more than 40% of Australia's total irrigated agriculture. But it wasn't just about farming. The energy component was equally revolutionary. The scheme's nine power stations, most notably the Tumut Complex and the Murray One plant, have a combined capacity of over 4 gigawatts. Murray One alone produces more than 1,400 gigawatt hours annually, enough to power 95,000 homes with renewable electricity. Today, Snowy 1.0 still produces 67% of Australia's hydroelectric power, making it the largest single contributor to the country's renewable energy mix. All this came at a cost of just 820 million Australian dollars back in 1974, equivalent to about 2 billion today. A small price, given the decades of benefit it has delivered, but times change and so do energy needs. Fast forward to the 21st century. Australia began aggressively expanding solar and wind power with Snowy Hydro, the company that manages the entire system, signing eight contracts in 2018 to build four solar plants and four wind farms. These new facilities contribute 2.8 terawatt hours of power annually, enough to light up half a million homes. That's impressive, but there's a catch. Solar and wind are inherently intermittent. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Sometimes these sources produce too much energy, and other times, not enough. That's where Snowy 2.0 comes in, a project designed to solve the storage problem and make renewable energy more reliable. At the heart of Snowy 2.0 is Pumped Hydro Energy Storage, PHES, a system that acts like a giant natural battery. Australia already had two massive reservoirs from the original scheme, Talbingo, with a capacity of 243 billion gallons, and Tantangra, holding another 67 billion. What separates them? Elevation, 2,300 feet of it. This vertical difference is key. The plan, build a tunnel connecting the two lakes, pump water uphill when excess energy is available, and release it downhill to generate electricity when demand spikes. The main tunnel alone is an engineering marvel, 33 feet wide over a mile long, and sloped at 25 degrees. Midway between the reservoirs, engineers are carving out a massive underground cavern, 72 feet wide, 164 feet high, and over 800 feet long. This space will house six reversible Francis turbines, each capable of generating 333 megawatts. When operating at full discharge, the system will generate 2.2 gigawatts of power, roughly 10% of Australia's total energy needs. And in terms of storage, Snowy 2.0 will hold 350,000 megawatt hours of energy, enough to provide backup power 
during extended periods when solar and wind fall short. The location was ideal, the water was already in place, and the height difference offered perfect conditions. On paper, everything looked like a slam dunk. So what went wrong? Construction began in 2019 with a projected completion date of 2024. But as of today, that target has been pushed back to 2027, with full operations not expected until at least 2028. The estimated cost? Initially between 3.8 and 4.5 billion Australian dollars. But today, that number has ballooned to nearly 12 billion, a staggering jump that has raised serious concerns. Part of the cost is due to the sheer complexity. Snowy Hydro needed three massive tunnel boring machines, TBM's Florence, Kirsten, and Lady Eileen Hudson. Each machine is a behemoth, and Florence alone cost $150 million. In fact, a dedicated factory had to be built on-site just to manufacture tunnel segments. Lady Eileen Hudson successfully carved a 1.77-mile diversion tunnel from Talbingo Reservoir to the underground power station. By October 2022, several support tunnels were also complete. In March of that year, work began on the main tunnel toward Tantangra. But then the problem started. During exploratory drilling, crews hit unexpected soft ground, which allowed hundreds of gallons of water to rush in. Standard procedure called for a reroute, which takes time and money. Engineers pushed forward anyway. Florence, the massive TBM, was deployed to cut through the area. Initially, everything went smoothly. But soon, the same soft soil brought the machine to a grinding halt. Snowy Hydro had touted Florence as one of the most advanced TBMs in the world. It even featured a sludge delivery system meant to stabilize loose soil. But it turns out that key components of that system were never installed. What happened next reads like a construction nightmare. The machine didn't completely stop, but it slowed drastically. Workers had to manually remove water and mud that reached over three feet deep, all while trying to keep Florence operational. At full speed, Florence should have advanced 100 to 165 feet per day, but progress was crawling. Then came the sinkhole in December 2022, after Florence managed to push through the unstable layer, the ground above her collapsed, leaving a 230-foot deep sinkhole at the surface. It was a dramatic symbol of just how unpredictable and difficult underground tunneling can be. Despite these setbacks, Snowy Hydro's leadership remains optimistic. CEO Dennis Barnes has insisted that the project is still viable and that the core technology remains sound. The company continues to make adjustments and push forward. But delays aren't just costing money. They're also raising questions about Australia's energy strategy. With climate change accelerating and the need for clean energy more urgent than ever, projects like Snowy 2.0 are crucial. But they also highlight the enormous logistical and technical challenges that come with transforming an energy grid. Still, if completed, Snowy 2.0 would be one of the largest pumped hydro energy storage systems in the world. Its ability to balance renewable supply and demand could make it the cornerstone of Australia's future energy resilience. Whether it's remembered as a groundbreaking achievement or a costly misstep will depend on what happens in the next few years. But one thing's certain, Snowy 2.0 is a bold bet on a greener tomorrow, and Australia is all in. Sweden is often hailed as a pioneer in sustainability, and for good reason. The country is known for its creative, resourceful strategies to reduce carbon emissions and conserve energy. One area where these innovations shine the brightest is in its heating systems. These systems range from the ordinary, like solar panels, to the extraordinary, such as capturing body heat from commuters and even using old Cold War era caves filled with near boiling water. Yes, caves. To understand how this works, we need to zoom in on the city of Esteros, located about 62 miles west of Stockholm. Hidden beneath this city are vast underground chambers filled with water heated to around 203 degrees Fahrenheit at first glance. It sounds like science fiction. But these caves aren't just hot reservoirs. They're an active part of the city's heating infrastructure. So, how did a Cold War relic become a futuristic energy storage system? Let's step back for a moment. Before centralized heating, most Swedish homes had individual boilers or stoves to stay warm. It worked, but it wasn't efficient. Then came the rise of district heating systems, where large plants generate heat at a central location and distribute it to homes and businesses through a network of insulated pipes. Today, more than 50% of all buildings in Sweden, residential, commercial, and industrial, are connected to this centralized heating grid. 
To put that in perspective, the EU average is just 6%. In Stockholm, the system is even more impressive. Over 1,860 miles of hot water pipes stretch beneath the capital, and 90% of the city relies on district heating. But what truly makes Sweden stand out isn't just the scale, it's the sources of that heat. Unlike many countries that still rely on fossil fuels, like coal or gas to warm water, Sweden has gone nearly fossil fuel free in its heating sector. Today, 95% of heating energy comes from renewable or recycled sources, and Sweden has no intention of stopping there. The goal? Achieve net zero emissions by 2030. One of Sweden's answers lies in the sky, literally. The sun plays a growing role in heating the nation. In 2021, Sweden unveiled Hogsladen, its largest solar heating project. Located in the town of Harnesand, this field of solar concentrators covers about 2.5 acres with a thermal output of 1.5 megawatts. Here's how it works. Sunlight is focused onto pipes carrying water using reflective surfaces. The water heats up and is then fed directly into the city's central heating system. During sunny periods, this setup can heat homes using nothing but sunlight, no oil, gas, or wood required. To illustrate the power of solar, just 10 square feet of solar collectors can produce the same amount of energy as burning 26 gallons of oil. Multiply that by thousands of panels, and you get a clean, powerful energy source. If solar energy is the most obvious form of heat, body heat might be the most unexpected. At Stockholm Central Station, over 200,000 people pass through daily, walking, standing, shopping, or waiting for their trains. All that movement produces heat, so why let it go to waste? The company Jernhusen decided to do something about it. They installed heat exchangers in the station's ventilation system. These capture the ambient warmth from passengers and transfer it to water pipes. That heated water is then used to warm up a nearby office building. Essentially, if you've ever walked through Stockholm Central, you've unknowingly helped heat a building. It's not just people that generate heat. Machines do too. Just think of how hot your laptop gets when it's running at full power. Now imagine rows upon rows of powerful servers inside data centers. These servers run 24-7, processing vast amounts of data, especially with the rise of AI. That means lots of excess heat. In Stockholm, IT companies have begun partnering with utility providers to recycle this heat, channeling it into the city's district heating grid. This isn't unique to Sweden. In nearby Helsinki, Finland, the company Vern reports that for every 1 megawatt of electricity consumed by its servers, about 1.3 megawatts of heat is generated, making data centers some of the most reliable sources of constant thermal energy. Another vital part of Sweden's heating puzzle is cogeneration, also known as combined heat and power, CHP. These plants burn fuel to spin turbines and generate electricity. But instead of letting the leftover heat escape into the air, it's captured and used to warm water. In Sweden, most CHP plants avoid fossil fuels. Instead, they use biomass with chips, bark, sawdust, and pellets, all leftovers from Sweden's massive timber industry. It's a smart way to give waste new life, but there are still challenges. Even clean burning biomass produces some emissions and demand for heat dips in warmer months, leading to energy waste. So, how do you store excess heat for later? Enter the caves. Back in the 1970s, during the Cold War, Sweden was officially neutral, but quietly prepared for the worst. One precaution involved building a massive underground oil storage facility in Vesteros, capable of holding 79 million gallons of oil. The idea was simple. In case of a global crisis, Sweden would have an independent energy reserve, but by 1985, with tensions easing and global oil strategies shifting, the facility was decommissioned. For decades, it sat abandoned, dark, damp, and largely forgotten. That is, until Maller Energy, a Swedish energy company, came up with a radical idea. Turn the old oil caves into a giant hot water battery. In 2021, the project began. It wasn't easy. While some oil had been removed, remnants still lingered, and the chambers held about 53 million gallons of water. To clean and convert the facility, hot water from the city's heating system was pumped into loosen and remove remaining oil, creating an eerily beautiful, steamy environment underground. Once cleaned, engineers installed 3,300 feet of piping, including 16-inch diameter mainlines, as well as wiring, sensors, heat exchangers, and all the infrastructure necessary to convert the caves into an energy storage system. 
By October 2023, construction was complete. In December, the caves began filling with hot water. The total cost, about 150 million Swedish kronor, roughly 13 million euros. But the benefits have already made the investment worthwhile. Now fully operational, the Vesteros cave system helps solve one of the biggest issues in renewable heating, seasonal imbalances. When it's cold, the demand for heating is high. But when it's warm, much of the heat produced by cogeneration plants goes unused. Instead of wasting that energy, the caves store it, acting like a giant thermal battery. When temperatures drop again, the stored heat can be released back into the system. This system also helps stabilize electricity production. Cogeneration plants often have to prioritize heat generation on cold days, limiting how much electricity they can produce. But with stored heat available on demand, plants can now focus more consistently on generating electricity when needed, improving overall efficiency. It's a brilliant example of how Sweden not only embraces sustainability, but reimagines the entire life cycle of infrastructure. From wartime oil bunker to modern-day climate solution, Sweden's heating innovations are more than clever. They're a blueprint for the future. From solar fields and biomass to body heat and data centers, the country has found ways to turn nearly every source of energy, no matter how unconventional, into a tool for sustainability. And now, even old Cold War caves have been given a second life, keeping homes warm while helping reduce emissions.